Scaramouche, A Romance of the French Revolution, by Raphael Sabatini. Book Three, Chapter Thirteen, Sanctuary. Into the late afternoon of that endless day of horror, with its perpetual alarms, its volleying musketry, rolling drums, and distant muttering of angry multitudes, Madame de Plogestel and Aline sat waiting in that handsome house in the Rue de Paradis. It was no longer for Rougain they waited. They realized that, be the reason what it might, and by now many reasons must no doubt exist, this friendly messenger would not return. They waited without knowing for what. They waited for whatever might be tied. At one time, early in the afternoon, the roar of battle approached them, racing swiftly in their direction, swelling each moment in volume and in horror. It was the frenzied clamor of a multitude drunk with blood and bent on destruction. Near at hand that fierce wave of humanity checked in its turbulent progress. Followed blows of pikes upon a door and imperious calls to open. And thereafter came the rending of timbers, the shivering of glass, screams of terror blending with screams of rage, and running through these shrill sounds the deeper diapason of bestial laughter. It was a hunt of two wretched Swiss guardsmen, seeking blindly to escape, and they were run to earth in a house in the neighborhood, and there cruelly done to death by that demoniac mob. The thing accomplished, the hunters, male and female, forming into a battalion, came swinging down the Rue du Paradis, chanting the song of Marseille, a song new to Paris in those days. Allons, enfants de la patrie, le jour de gloire est arrive, contre nous de la tyrannie, L'étendard sanglant élève. Nearer it came, raucously bawled by some hundreds of voices. A dread sound that had come so suddenly to displace, at least temporarily, the merry, trivial air of the Sa Ira, which hitherto had been the revolutionary carillon. Instinctively, Madame de Plogestel and Aline clung to each other. They had heard the sound of the ravishing of that other house in the neighborhood, without knowledge of the reason. What if now it should be the turn of the Hôtel Plogestel? There was no real cause to fear it, save that amid a turmoil imperfectly understood and therefore the more awe-inspiring, the worst must be feared always. The dreadful song so dreadfully sung and the thunder of heavily shod feet upon the roughly paved street, passed on and receded. They breathed again, almost as if a miracle had saved them, to yield to fresh alarm an instant later, when Madame's young footman, Jacques, the most trusted of her servants, burst into their presence unceremoniously with a scared face, bringing the announcement that a man who had just climbed over the garden wall professed himself a friend of madame's, and desired to be brought immediately to her presence. "'But he looks like a sans-culotte, madame,' the staunch fellow warned her. Her thoughts and hopes leapt at once to Rougain. "'Bring him in,' she commanded breathlessly. Jacques went out to return presently accompanied by a tall man in a long, shabby, and very ample overcoat, and a wide-brimmed hat that was turned down all around, and adorned by an enormous tricolor cockade. This hat he removed as he entered. Jacques, standing behind him, perceived that his hair, 
although now in some disorder, bore signs of having been carefully dressed. It was clubbed, and it carried some lingering vestiges of powder. The young footman wondered what it was in the man's face, which was turned from him, that should cause his mistress to out and recoil. Then he found himself dismissed, abruptly, by a gesture. The newcomer advanced to the middle of the salon, moving like a man exhausted and breathing hard. There he leaned against a table across which he confronted Madame de Plagestel, and she stood regarding him, a strange horror in her eyes. In the background, on a settle at the salon's far end, sat Aline, staring in bewilderment and some fear at a face which, if unrecognizable through the mask of blood and dust that smeared it, was yet familiar. And then the man spoke, and instantly she knew the voice for that of the Marquis de la Tour d'Azir. My dear friend, he was saying, forgive me if I startled you. Forgive me if I thrust myself in here without leave at such a time in such a manner. But you see how it is with me. I am a fugitive. In the course of my distracted flight, not knowing which way to turn for safety, I thought of you. I told myself that if I could but safely reach your house, I might find sanctuary. You are in danger? In danger. Almost he seemed silently to laugh at the unnecessary question. If I were to show myself openly in the streets just now, I might with luck contrive to live for five minutes. My friend, it has been a massacre. Some few of us escaped from the Tuileries at the end to be hunted to death in the streets. I doubt if by this time a single Swiss survives. They had the worst of it. Poor devils. And as for us, my God, they hate us more than they hate the Swiss. Hence this filthy disguise. He peeled off the shaggy great coat and casting it from him stepped forth in the black satin that had been the general livery of the hundred knights of the dagger, who had rallied in the Tuileries that morning to the defense of their king. His coat was rent across the back, his neckcloth and the ruffles at his wrists were torn and blood-stained. With his smeared face and disordered headdress, he was terrible to behold. Yet he contrived to carry himself with his habitual easy assurance, remembered to kiss the trembling hand which Madame de Plagestel extended to him in welcome. "'You did well to come to me, Gervais,' she said. "'Yes. Here is sanctuary for the present. You will be quite safe, at least for as long as we are safe.' My servants are entirely trustworthy. Sit down, and tell me all. He obeyed her, collapsing almost into the armchair which she thrust forward. A man exhausted, whether by physical exertion or by nerve strain, or both. He drew a handkerchief from his pocket and wiped some of the blood and dirt from his face. It is soon told... His tone was bitter with the bitterness of despair. This, my dear, is the end of us. Plagestel is lucky in being across the frontier at such a time. Had I not been fool enough to trust those who today have proved themselves utterly unworthy of trust, that is where I should be myself. My remaining in Paris is the crowning folly of a life full of follies and mistakes. That I should come to you, 
in my hour of most urgent need, adds point to it. He laughed in his bitterness. Madame moistened her dry lips. And... And now, she asked him, it only remains to get away as soon as may be, if it is still possible. Here in France there is no longer any room for us, at least not above ground. Today has proved it. And then he looked up at her, standing there beside him so pale and timid, and he smiled. He patted the fine hand that rested upon the arm of his chair. My dear Therese, unless you carry charitableness to the length of giving me to drink, you will see me perish of thirst under your eyes before ever the canaille has a chance to finish me. She started. I should have thought of it, she cried in self-reproach, and she turned quickly. Aline, she begged, tell Jacques to bring— Aline, he echoed interrupting and swinging round in his turn. Then, as Aline rose into view, detaching from her background, and he at last perceived her, he heaved himself abruptly to his weary legs again, and stood there stiffly bowing to her across the space of gleaming floor. Mademoiselle, I had not suspected your presence, he said, and he seemed extraordinarily ill at ease. A man startled, as if caught in an illicit act. I perceived it, monsieur, she answered. As she advanced to do madame's commission, she paused before him. From my heart, monsieur, I grieve that we should meet again in circumstances so very painful. Not since the day of his duel with André Louis, the day which had seen the death and burial of his last hope of winning her, had they stood face to face. He checked, as if on the point of answering her. His glance strayed to Madame de Plagestel, and, oddly reticent for one who could be very glib, he bowed in silence. But sit, monsieur, I beg. You are fatigued. You are gracious to observe it. With your permission, then. And he resumed his seat. She continued on her way to the door, and passed out upon her errand. When presently she returned, they had almost unaccountably changed places. It was Madame de Plogestel who was seated in that armchair of brocade and gilt, and M. de la Tour d'Azir, who, despite his lassitude, was leaning over the back of it talking earnestly, seeming by his attitude to plead with her. On Aline's entrance he broke off instantly and moved away, so that she was left with a sense of having intruded. Further, she observed that the Countess was in tears. Following her came presently the diligent Jacques, bearing a tray laden with food and wine. Madame poured for her guest, and he drank a long draught of the burgundy, then begged, holding forth his grimy hands, that he might mend his appearance before sitting down to eat. He was led away and valeted by Jacques, and when he returned he had removed from his person the last vestige of the rough handling he had received. He looked almost his normal self, the disorder in his attire repaired, calm and dignified and courtly in his bearing, but very pale and haggard of face, seeming suddenly to have increased in years, to have reached in appearance the age that was in fact his own. As he ate and drank, and this with appetite, for as he told them he had not tasted food since early morning, he entered into the details 
of the dreadful events of the day, and gave them the particulars of his own escape from the Tuileries, when all was seen to be lost, and when the Swiss, having burnt their last cartridge, were submitting to wholesale massacre at the hands of the indescribably furious mob. Oh, it was all most ill done, he ended critically. We were timid, when we should have been resolute, and resolute at last, when it was too late. That is the history of our side from the beginning of this accursed struggle. We have lacked proper leadership throughout, and now, as I have said already, there is an end to us. It but remains to escape, as soon as we can discover how the thing is to be accomplished. Madame told him of the hopes that she had centred upon Rougain. It lifted him out of his gloom. He was disposed to be optimistic. "'You are wrong to have abandoned that hope,' he assured her. "'If this mayor is so well disposed, he certainly can do as his son promised.' But last night it would have been too late for him to have reached you, and today, assuming that he had come to Paris, almost impossible for him to win across the streets from the other side, it is most likely that he will yet come. I pray that he may, for the knowledge that you and Mademoiselle de Kerquedieu are out of this would comfort me above all. We should take you with us said madame. Ah, but how? Young Rougain was to bring me permits for three persons, Aline, myself, and my footman Jacques. You would take the place of Jacques. Faith, to get out of Paris, madame, there is no man whose place I would not take. And he laughed. Their spirits rose with his, and their flagging hopes revived. But as dusk descended again upon the city, without any sign of the deliverer they awaited, those hopes began to ebb once more. Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir at last pleaded weariness, and begged to be permitted to withdraw that he might endeavour to take some rest against whatever might have to be faced in the immediate future. When he had gone, Madame persuaded Aline to go and lie down. "'I will call you, my dear, the moment he arrives,' she said, bravely maintaining that pretense of a confidence that had by now entirely evaporated. Aline kissed her affectionately and departed outwardly so calm and unperturbed as to leave the countess wondering whether she realized the peril by which they were surrounded, a peril infinitely increased by the presence in that house of a man so widely known and detested as Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, a man who was probably being sought for by his enemies at this moment. Left alone, Madame lay down on a couch in the salon itself, to be ready for any emergency. It was a hot summer night, and the glass doors opening upon the luxuriant garden stood wide to admit the air. On that air came intermittently from the distance sounds of the continuing horrible activities of the populace the aftermath of that bloody day. Madame de Plogestel lay there, listening to those sounds for upwards of an hour, thanking heaven that for the present at least the disturbances were distant, dreading lest at any moment they should occur nearer at hand, lest this bondy section in which her hotel was situated should become the scene of horrors similar to those whose echoes reached her ears from other sections away to the south and west. The couch occupied by the countess lay in shadow, for all the lights in that long salon 
had been extinguished with the exception of a cluster of candles in a massive silver candle branch placed on a round marquetry table in the middle of the room an island of light in the surrounding gloom the timepiece on the overmantel chimed melodiously the hour of ten and then startling in the suddenness with which it broke the immediate silence another sound vibrated through the house and brought madame to her feet in a breathless mingling of hope and dread someone was knocking sharply on the door below followed moments of agonized suspense culminating in the abrupt invasion of the room by the footman jacques he looked round not seeing his mistress at first madame madame he panted out of breath what is it jacques her voice was steady now that the need for self-control seemed thrust upon her she advanced from the shadows into that island of light about the table there is a man below he is asking he is demanding to see you at once a man she questioned he he seems to be an official at least he wears the sash of office and he refused to give any name he says that his name would convey nothing to you he insists that he must see you in person and at once an official said madame an official jacques repeated i would not have admitted him but that he demanded it in the name of the nation madame it is for you to say what shall be done robert is with me if you wish it whatever it may be my good jacques no no she was perfectly composed if this man intended evil surely he would not come alone conduct him to me and then beg mademoiselle de kercadiou to join me if she is awake jacques departed himself partly reassured madame seated herself in the armchair by the table well within the light she smoothed her dress with a mechanical hand if as it would seem her hopes had been futile so had her momentary fears a man on any but an errand of peace would have brought some following with him as she had said the door opened again and jacques reappeared after him stepping briskly past him came a slight man in a wide-brimmed hat adorned by a tricolor cockade about the waist of an olive-green riding-coat he wore a broad tricolor sash a sword hung at his side he swept off his hat and the candlelight glinted on the steel buckle in front of it madame found herself silently regarded by a pair of large dark eyes set in a lean brown face eyes that were most singularly intent and searching she leaned forward incredulity swept across her countenance then her eyes kindled and the color came creeping back into her pale cheeks she rose suddenly she was trembling andre louis she exclaimed End of Book 3, Chapter 13